Hi, I'm Cameron Kirkyu, the writer of Gilgamesh Eternal. Uh, you can check out the second issue of Gilgamesh Eternal now at gilgameshcomic.com. You can also find me on Twitter at Cam Kirkyu. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. So who is our guest today? Our guest today is a very talented comic creator. He has created an amazing comic called Gilgamesh Eternal, which is currently on Zoop. From what I've seen, it's a beautifully drawn and colored comic. And I'll let him describe exactly, you know, what it's all about. Joined today by the ever-talented... Cam Kirkow, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. How are you? Doing good. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I am Cam Kirkew. I'm a professional comics and editor. I've been working at SourcePoint Press for the last two years, and I recently left to lean more into freelance arena. I am also the writer of uh, the comic Gilgamesh Eternal, which is now in its second issue on Zoop available at gilgameshcomic.com. So what's Gilgamesh all about? So Gilgamesh Eternal is a reimagining of the Epic of Gilgamesh as a fantasy action comic with art by Costas Pantulis and letters by Mira Mortal. The Epic of Gilgamesh is the world's oldest story dating back almost five millennia, but Gilgamesh's dilemma is something that remains relevant to us all today and always will. How can you live peacefully after you've been truly confronted by your own mortality? I just want to live day by day. That's all I can hope for. <laughs> But how did you find these creative and talented individuals to put together this amazing comic? Costas, I found online, he was posting his portfolio on a lot of message boards full of people looking for collaboration. I had been looking for an artist for this comic for months before finding his work. I knew that I wanted Gilgamesh to look unique. I wasn't really sure what that meant until I found Costas. Uh, and once I found Costas' portfolio... I was blown away and intrigued. I knew that I wanted Gilgamesh to look like nothing else. So I reached out to him. We hit it off pretty quickly and have worked really well together. We're on the same wavelength about many, many things. Mira was recommended to me from Josh Werner, the editor-in-chief at, at SourcePoint Press. I asked if he knew any really talented letters. He said, yes, of course, Mira. And so I reached out to her and she was gracious enough to come on board. I'm really glad she did because it would be a totally different book without her. So then what does Costas bring to your comic that you were looking for? Because this is a 5,000-year-old tale that has been in the annals of history forever. But what does he bring from an art style perspective that just made everything look the way it does? He has a look that is entirely his own. He has a way of bringing different otherworldly elements together in a, a very interesting way. In our book with the gods, for instance, they have this strange kind of science fiction, bioorganic, monstrous kind of look to them, which is beautiful and scary. At the same time, I'm not really sure where exactly it comes from, other than Costas is just an inspired individual. What's the most misunderstood aspect about the Gilgamesh story that maybe people who don't follow the mythology, maybe they don't understand? I wouldn't dare call myself an expert on the myth. You know, this is, of course, my own creative interpretation. I certainly wouldn't call anyone wrong for reading it in a way that was different than how I read it. I know that for me, I was a little bit disappointed in the ending. I think that things kind of wrap up a little bit too nicely in the original epic. By the end of our story, we're going to flip some things on their head, surprise people who might already be familiar with where the myth ends up. You have a Zoop campaign here, and there have been a number of platforms available for crowdfunding services here. What does Zoop bring to crowdfunding that made you go with this particular platform compared to, say, other platforms? We did attempt to fund this comic. The second issue on Kickstarter campaign was unsuccessful for, I think, a variety of reasons. When it didn't fund, I had a lot of people reach out to me recommending Zoop. The number one question I got was, okay, well, are you going to try Zoop now? So I had started looking at their platform pretty quickly after that. They actually reached out to me because they were 
aware of the book and felt like it could have new life on their platform. I think that it does. I think that Zoot's geared towards comics specifically. I think it understands its user base a lot better. I think that because of the size of, of their organization, they're able to be a little bit more intimate with the customer experience and provide simpler, more satisfying shopping experience. You definitely don't feel like you're alone when you have a Zoot campaign running. It feels like joining a team a little bit. And I appreciate that. I see that it's funded. So congratulations on that. And you Thank have you. like three weeks to go. So that's wonderful to see as well, too. Once you reloaded the page, I don't know how many times and wore out your, your keyboard. Now that it's funded, what are your next steps? At this point in the campaign, my big concern is reaching out to retailers. What we can offer them to make having Gilgamesh in their store appealing to them because, you know, I think that that is where fan bases are. A certain fan base is created and grows. There's only so many times you can post on Twitter about book. Eventually, you just got to start calling people up, I think. For those that want to support this campaign what else do you have available that's really cool tell us what we have we have three covers we've got the standard cover a from costas and then we have two variant covers cover b from kit wallace featuring gilgamesh and this really dope action pose looking ferocious and, and ready to tear your face off which is really cool because it's it's a side of the character that we don't see very often in the interior art and kit is just wonderful the talent and inspiration in that cover is endless and cover c is from dennis men here it's another beautiful beautiful cover that he did featuring shamha a minor character in the first issue but who is going to become kind of enter the spotlight in the second issue she is gilgamesh's closest friend and the high priestess to anana who is playing the villain role in our story. So she's kind of caught in between these two godly forces in the second issue in uh, ways that I think that people will find interesting. And yeah, Dennis, he knocked this cover out of the park. It's something I really want to just print it out and hang it on my wall. It's gorgeous. Big poster, you know, just stick it behind the computer screen there so you can just stare up at it every so often. Yeah, exactly. Nice. <laughs> I love it. From, from your time at SourcePoint, what did you pick up from that company that is going to help you get the word out for Gilgamesh? Huh. You know, I spent a lot of time at conventions in booths selling SourcePoint comics to, you know, right to fans. You, you go out a lot representing the, the company and the product and talking to people and seeing, you know, what appeals to different audiences about your story. And that's true of talking to retailers as well. I did, you know, spend a lot of time talking to retailers on SourcePoint's behalf. I think just a top down view of the industry and of the hobby was able to take advantage of while working with SourcePoint. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? That is a, a really good question. I forgot who said it, but I once heard a piece of advice on how to sell the reader on a series in the first issue was that the first issue of a comic series should get the reader completely immersed and invested in this world that you created and uh, make them think that they totally understand, you know, everything about it. And then on the last page, you reveal to them that everything they just learned was wrong. It's a way to hook them in and kind of sweep the rug out from underneath them so that in future issues, they're ready to follow your lead. You know, they're open for whatever happens next. And I call that the second wisest piece of advice only because it only applies to the first issue. So then what was an early experience that where you learned that language had power? So I think that everybody kind of, at least unconsciously, understands the power that language has over us. But I think that probably an early experience that really opened my eyes to the breadth and the depth of the power of language was reading uh, Slaughterhouse-Five. In middle school, there's a lot of really neat uh, language tricks in that book that I hadn't really encountered previously or that I hadn't encountered in a way that had much of a, an effect on me. The one that most people are probably familiar with is the refrain, so it goes after whenever it's mentioned that somebody dies. 
he'll follow it up with so it goes and at first you don't really think anything of it as the book goes on you see the phrase more and more often and eventually it gets to the point where you get a little sick reading the words just because of of the frequency of it the meaning evolves and your reaction intensifies not because the context has changed but because the frequency has increased so yeah i think that reading that book was probably an early moment where i realized there was more to language than context and semantics and that you could use things like uh, rhythm and repetition, that sort of thing to to strengthen your message. You know, now that you have a successful comic book that's that's funded and you have issues one and two taken care of here, if you couldn't do this as a career, what would you do? I don't really think about that too often because writing and editing is really the only thing I know how to do well. So I'd have to start over somewhere from the beginning. And if I was going to do that, I guess I would become a stage magician or something silly like that. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? Creatively, it's hard to pick one, but I will. I almost feel like it's my answer is a cliche. You know, everybody says Alan Moore. For me, that is true. I respond the most to the British invasion writers. And if I had to choose one, it'd be more if for nothing else than because I believe he is the one who said something along the lines of a comic should be as visually exciting as any film and as thematically layered as any novel. I'm not sure he's the one that said it, and I'm not sure that that's exactly what he said. It sounds right. That's something for now. I hold kind of central in my attempts at storytelling. From a professional standpoint, you have created two issues for your amazing comic, Gilgamesh Eternal. And hey, it's successfully funded. So that's half the battle right there. So congratulations on that. And I look forward to many issues and whatever else you do in the future as well, too. So professionally, you are successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah, I think so. Depending on how you define personal success, I would define it as being surrounded by people that you care about and who care about you. And that's true in my case. Yeah, I'm very grateful to have some beautiful people supporting me. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failure? I deal with my failures with grace, humility, and style. No, if I'm going through something that I consider a big failure, I usually spend a couple of days in a depressive state, moping around the house and irritating my wife. And after that, I will collect myself, examine what I could have done differently, acknowledge the things I had no control over, and then I will make plans for my next steps. And the copious amounts of ice cream. <laughs> I'm allergic to milk, so. Oh. <laughs> the younger generation is looking at your work and becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer or a creative person in some way, shape, or form. Maybe you've inspired them on that particular path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Always the best thing to do for every generation is to look at what the previous generation did, learn from it, and then do something entirely different that nobody will see coming. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Okay, what would its title be? Its title would be, I have a stomach ache and I will not be brave about it. And the soundtrack will be, whew, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe Queen, just nice and classic. Well, Cam, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. It's been a blast. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where can we find the campaign on the internet and any future works that you decide to create? You can follow me on social media at Cam Kirkyu. I am most active on Twitter, but you can also find me on Instagram and Facebook. You can check out our campaign now at GilgameshComic.com. Well, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others, quite literally, on our website, TGTmedia.com or TwoGeeksTalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website, because I'm only one person. Give me a break. It's youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT media. And of course, the podcast is back after 12 or so years on twogeekstalking.podbean.com. But you can find it on any streaming service like iHeartRadio, Alexia, and whatever else is available. I don't know. There's like 13 or 14 of them. Just pick, pick the one. Search for Two Geeks Talk and you'll find it. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. 
Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.